Thank you for having me here today. And thank you, Elizabeth, for inviting me. So I'll be uh, telling you about my studies during my master's, which was about uh, eight years ago or so. And I worked in the Kalahari Desert and we were interested in whether Kalahari birds can beat the heat uh, with these uh, changes that are happening uh, due to climate change. And to do so, we looked at the role of artificial water points and shade in structuring arid zone avian communities. So globally, climate change poses a major threat to biodiversity, and this is associated with very extreme weather events. And desert environments are particularly harsh, and they have very elevated temperatures with little or no rainfall. And the endotherms that are within these environments, such as birds, are usually faced with hypothermia, also known as overheating. And this is a situation where air temperatures approach or exceed body temperature of birds. And when birds are in this um, situation, they often change their behavior. In some cases, they seek for shade, as you can see uh, the bird there doing, or they can employ thermoregulatory behaviors to ensure evaporative cooling, like on the bird uh, in the top right where you can see it panting with its bill open or bringing its wings further uh, outwards, uh, also known as wing drooping. So this kind of behavior is also associated with some risk and this is dehydration. So birds have uh, this trade-off between overheating or getting dehydrated at very elevated temperatures. So one way in order to minimize these trade-offs, birds rely on open standing free surface water, like we can see in the picture to the right. So in the Australian and Namib desert, it has been found that about 30% of the birds there rely on surface water. While in the Kalahari, there's about 50% which are quite dependent on surface water. And as we can see on the map to the right, uh, the Kalahari, which is highlighted, uh, the white arrow has a very high mean maximum temperatures of between 38 to about 42 degrees centigrade. Now, during the hottest time of the year, the birds are observed utilizing artificial water points because uh, there are often livestock farms within these areas. Now these artificial water points are very open and devoid of vegetation. So as you can see in the picture in the middle, when the birds are drinking, they experience very elevated environmental temperatures. And there is evidence to show that the operative temperature changes quite drastically when they move from the shade to the sun. So we set out to address two main questions. The first one is, does shade have an effect on the number of birds visiting artificial water holes? Here we predicted that the provision of shade would actually increase the number of birds visiting and they will do so across the day. And then secondly, we predicted that smaller birds are more likely to use uh, water holes more than bigger birds because smaller birds have a higher surface area to volume ratio making them lose heat uh, way faster. So secondly, we were interested in how water availability could determine the richness and the distribution of bird communities in an arid environment. And here we predicted that birds would restrict their uh, use of the landscape due to the presence of water. So our study site was in uh, the Southern Kalahari of South Africa on the livestock farm. And this area is characterized by a dry river bird in the north. And as you move southwards, uh, there are relatively high sand dunes. So based on the, crop, uh, the livestock rotation system there, and also accessibility, we chose six water points 
where we shaded uh, three of them, which are the dark stars and the lighter stars at the control water points. So uh, the shaded uh, water points looked like the picture on the top left, uh, where we had some wooden frames and we clipped shade cloths onto these wooden frames. And below we have the unshaded water points, which had wooden frames to cancel out uh, any effect that could be introduced by it. So we used the uh, before after control impact design, where during the first, first phase of the study, we had our uh, water points all unshaded and during the second half, we shaded only half of them. So centrally within our study site, we had a, a weather station which recorded temperature, humidity and rainfall. We also placed camera traps few meters away from our uh, shade uh, frames in order to take pictures of the water holes from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. in the evening. And this took pictures uh, every minute. So we had a very overwhelming amount of data. And so we decided to sample five hour slots. So within each frame, we counted the total number of birds and also the number of birds per species. So for analysis, we used G-test uh, with a chi-square distribution to calculate the proportion of bird visits to control an experimental water point during both phases of the study. And we did this uh, across the day. Secondly, we ran GLMMs using a poison distribution for our count data. And then we converted this to bird visitation rate per hour. And we had our predictor variables, uh, which included the phase, of the study, the treatment, and the interaction between the two. And secondly, we ran a similar model for species richness. So on average, we found that the daily maximum temperature during our study was about 32 degrees centigrade. And we could see that air temperatures continue to rise uh, uh, from the early hours up until 3 p.m. and Subsequently, the temperatures began to decline, but it was still quite high between 6 and 7 p.m. So to the right, we have the proportional visitation rates. And as you can see for phase A of the study, uh, there wasn't any uh, major differences between uh, visitation rates at the control and experimental water points. However, if we look at uh, the phase B, we can see that the experimental, um, the experimental water points, but include increase their visitation rates during the hottest time of the day, which is between three and four p.m. So we also looked at the overall bird visits uh, per hour between phase A and phase B of the study. In open cycles and dashed lines, we have the control water points. And in dark uh, cycles and solid lines, we have the experimental water points. So we can see that there was no change between phase A and B for control water points, but there was a very significant decrease in birds at phase B, which was quite surprising for us. So we looked more closely at uh, the top 10 species, how they were found drinking, and we noticed that there were negative responders and positive responders. So um, the doves, such as the Kipdodo dove and the Namako dove in plot A and C, uh, had a very strong decline at our uh, experimental water points. And this was similar for the sociable weaver, plot B, and plot D, the white-browed sparrow weaver. In gray, we have a uh, results which are only near significant. So this was the case as well for the southern gray-headed sparrow. And then conversely, we found that we had positive responders. Here we have the violet-eared waxbill and the red-headed finch. Now this was not particularly surprising because we had predicted that the birds which are smaller would tend to lose heat faster and therefore 
be at more risk of getting dehydrated. And for the negative responders, particularly the dose, we speculated that they might be viewing that this shade as an obstruction because there's an additional risk that is associated with water points, which is predation. So for our second question, we placed 10 grids on the landscape and each point was at least uh, 250 meters apart. Here we conducted five minute point counts and this was done in the morning and in the afternoon. In stars, we have the water points. So we measured site variables and this included uh, the type of vegetation, vegetation height, percentage grass cover amongst others. We also recorded heat dissipating behaviors, whether they were panting or wing drooping. And we also noted if they were perched in the sun or in the shade. Finally, we measured the nearest distance to water uh, from each point. So for analysis, we use occupancy modeling, which uh, employ hierarchical models to calculate probability of detection and the probability of occurrence. And here we had our predictors uh, being vegetation, vegetation height, our also uh, known as the time of day, temperature and the distance from water. Secondly, we ran linear regression models where we used water dependency uh, species abundance index. And for this, uh, we calculated this as the total number of birds that were seen visiting water points. So from our first question divided by the relative abundance of birds from our point count data. And so we also uh, included the predictors, which were the distance from water, the dietary guild, the thermoregulatory behavior, and also the vegetation height. So for probability of detection, we found that the white browed sparrow weaver and the Cape Trout dove were more likely to be sighted higher up the tree, which may indicate that they were using this as a canopy uh, for shaded environments. And looking at temperature, we found that as uh, temperature increased, it was more likely to detect the Cape Trout dove as opposed to the Kalahari scrub robin which uh, was also not particularly surprising as the Kalahari scrub robin might be hiding away from very high temperatures of the day. So the southern gray-headed sparrow was the only bird that uh, had an interaction between temperature and time of the day, which suggests that as temperature increased at specific times of the day, it was more difficult to uh, detect these birds. And this could suggest that these birds are particularly sensitive to some of the temperatures we measured during our study. So for our probability of occurrence, we didn't find a correlation between water dependence and any of the heat dissipation behaviors or the shade taking behavior. However, we found that water was one of the most important variables and there was a very strong negative relationship between water dependence and the proximity to water. And granivores were more likely to be found closer to water points than insectivores. This was quite similar for the total species richness. And we can see that birds declined as you moved away from um, water point, and we actually lost at least two species per kilometer. However, we also found something interesting that as we moved away from these water points, we were able to detect uh, the chestnut vented tit babbler and the scaly feathered finch even more, which shows that they do not restrict their position due to the water sources. And this was quite surprising for the scaly feathered finch because it was uh, one of the smallest uh, of the birds we found during our study, weighing about 12 grams. So this is to suggest that there is 
actually another part of the population that still persists uh, independent of whether water is present and they might also be deriving water from their diet, uh, which is also known as the oxidative water. So in conclusion, our study uh, indicates that birds respond differently to the presence of shade and water. And the species found most at water holes may be at risk in the near future. And the bird species such as the violet at waxbill may be easily managed under climate change uh, because they respond positively to the provision of shade. However, the provision of shade can also be unbeneficial for species such as the keep turtle dove, which have an additional risk of predation while drinking. And it might be worth uh, conducting similar studies, but probably uh, providing partial shade as opposed to like uh, complete shade. So granivores also may be at risk uh, because they might restrict their position within the landscape due to the presence of water. And so if temperatures continue to increase, they might not be able to utilize the landscape as much. And finally, bird communities may be impacted in the absence of water points or if water points get closed, uh, some birds might be pushed to very lethal hypothermic uh, limits. So if you'd like to know more about this study, you can uh, read about it in the Journal of Arid Environment and in Ostrich. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my supervisors, uh, all the Hotbird project members, uh, and a thanks to Lily and Johan for letting us carry, their, carry out our project on their farm, and to the Fitzpatrick Institute for funding this project. And with that, I want to thank you all for listening. most of uh, the points you raised. And you spoke about um, the birds being afraid to drown. I, I believe that definitely this is a possibility, but at least the troughs we had, they actually measure like about 20 centimeter high. So they are not super deep. And because the water is always pumping from this uh, central bubble, so the water levels do not really go very low. So the birds can actually uh, easily get to the water. At least this is based on my observation. And they they would uh, even take baths sometimes uh, when it's really hot. Uh, so at least I haven't uh, noticed any bird drowning uh, within the uh, troughs during our study uh, period. And you also uh, mentioned the temperature of the water. And yeah, that would have been really interesting, but. We unfortunately didn't do that. And I want to believe that the water is quite hot because some of the troughs are actually made of uh, made out of metal. So that could also be a disadvantage to actually visiting uh, this uh, water point. And these water points have been there for quite a while because it's, it's like a livestock farm. So it would be nice to definitely dig the ground and put it as you stated, but we just decided to work with what was already existing and uh, to avoid uh, tempering with any uh, of their, their stuff within the farm. And yeah, when you speak about uh, natural shade, it's quite hard to move these water points because they are already fixed. Like it's uh, what we found that we just uh, made uh, use of and Actually, I was also thinking that if we use more natural uh, things such as thatch or grass, maybe the birds will be less uh, scared of the shade uh, that we actually provided. So maybe they should mimic uh, the natural environment. And it's very hard for any vegetation to grow around these uh, water points because the animals, it's like from cattle, to like antelopes, there's just like, sometimes there's like wild beasts going through the farm. So it's very hard for any vegetation to grow around those uh, water points. 
in, yeah, in my experience. There was actually a few of the water troughs that were made out of, uh, they, they look like plastic, but they're not exactly plastic. I'll have to find out what they were made out of, but certainly the metals would be of disadvantage to the birds.